maternal grandfather. Well, it happens that Carlos Torre Repeto, for those of you in the know about the world of chess or the history of chess in the continent, uh, Carlos Torre Repeto is, along with American Paul Morphy and Cuban uh, Raul Capablanca, Jose Raul Capablanca, the greatest uh, chess player ever born in, in Mexico. No, in this country. Uh, uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, he was not the only illustrious member of his family. But since we have a very short time, I'm going just basically to pass to uh, mention that he is currently the Director of Research and Graduate Studies at the Facultad de Ciencias Antropológicas at this university, which is the most important university in the, in the peninsula of uh, Yucatan. He got his PhD in Anthropology from the University, uh, university of Florida in 1994. And his research has focused on identity and rituals and currently on academic tourism and ethnography and the theorization of international academic exchanges. He has written uh, several, several books about different subjects uh, in life in Yucatan, for example, Una Población Perdida en la Memoria, uh, about the, the African population of Yucatan. He has another book on popular religion. Uh, and another one on uh, uh, festivities of Isamal. Isamal is this beautiful town that is not far from Merida. It's a, it's a town that when you have the chance to visit, you will see that you are not going to see any other color in that town but yellow. Every single building is painted in, in that color. So it's, it's hallucinating, almost surreal. It's a great place to be. Uh, so please uh, welcome uh, Professor Fernando Rapetti. Another important thing is that uh, Maya language is the second most spoken language. 
language in, in, in Mexico, the third one would be Nahuatl. So it is very important in terms of what is uh, Maya language and the presence of Maya language. I also <coughs> have to add, for instance, that there, are both, uh, there is a very important relation of Maya language literature and poems all over the Yucatan Peninsula, and this was supported by the uh, federal and state government. Another important thing is that uh, up to 2010, the state of Yucatan, here I'm just talking about the, the area that is in white, the, um, there was around, well, now there are around 34% of the population uh, of inhabitants across five years and all, or order of the state of Yucatan speak Maya. And if you realize I'm not talking about Mayan people, I'm just referring basically to the ones in which can speak Maya and tell you that they, are, that they speak Maya. And later on I'm going to explain that a little bit more. Okay? So this is the general aspect. So we are talking about um, a population that speak a native um, uh, American language. And in this case, they also are they do have a very strong presence, not just in, in, in Mexico. And another important thing I may add is that um, Maya language in general is a well-respected language among some other uh, ethnic groups in, in Mexico. So for instance, it's easy to say that someone who speaks Zapotec, they will say, okay, Maya language is a very prestigious language, even though there are also a very important uh, writers in, in Zapotec, for instance, okay? <coughs> and now we are going back a little bit more about how they start naming the Maya, or how they start naming the people in, in Mayan speaker, actually. One of the first things is that when the Spaniards arrived into the Yucatan Peninsula, or the one of the states, the thing is that mostly the organiz they were organized in a kind of lineage uh, of chieftains, maybe, in which they will have this uh, Maya name called Cuchicabal. And all this, according to voice, there were 19 of them. And they were grouped together around uh, the patroning, around the same patroning. And for instance, the Cojón, the Shu, the Tsa, there were some of the pat uh, patronings in which they were grouped together. So they were also, and it's also quite important, during colonial sources, they refer to them not as Mayas. They refer to them mainly as Indians in general. And they also recognize that the term, um, that the term Maya was basically used and to name the language they speak. So there were Indian, there were called Indian who speak Maya languages. There are just a few ways in which, oh, I'm sorry, there are just a few documents in which you can see that they call themselves Maya, but they are very rarely. So, in Indian so colonial sources, you can also tell one of the terms to which they start recognizing themselves that is the term Masiwai. So, as I was saying, the term Maya was not used uh, in, uh, to refer to the Mayan, uh, the Mayan speakers in the Yucatan Peninsula. Another important thing is that when the colonial uh, authorities start congregating the Indians because they were all over the places and they had to have a better control. Uh, they start congregating people into pueblos uh, or, or villages. A kind of identity related to residence start developing. So you may start referring to yourself, to yourself as part of this or this other. For instance, you can say whatever Tikul, and you you were part of uh, a little more complicated Oshkutska or some other. So you start referring as the residential, and it's part, and it was quite important to talk about the place of residence, and you start, let's say, control, construct an identity more related to the local, instead of talking about the relation that you could have in terms of that you, for instance, in Oskuska, and also in, in Tikul, were actually speaking the same language. So, as a result, they stopped using the patronic name, and another thing is that because of the congregation policies, people from different patronages were actually getting together. So it was not a good strategy and they didn't reproduce the, um, the situation they had before in terms of recognizing us coming from one lineage or another. 
Another important thing is that there was this important event in 18 that went from 1847 to 1876, and I put 1901 because the, the, the whole presence of the Castle War, the, the Castle War was quite important for them. And one of that is that there is an indigenous rebellion in which there was also this called Castle War because it was uh, Mayan Indians against, or Indians, we can say, against uh, Spaniards. So they call it that way. But however, it was a way through which uh, Indians want to take back the lands that they need to support their living. Okay, so that's basically that we can say. But also, one important and key element that also they take part because even though there was a fight, of course, there, were, um, there was also a revivalization movement because they thought, and also a prophetic movement. It was supposed that there was this talking cross and they would start sending messages to the Mayan population. I'm using, I'm not gonna do that, but the Mayan population in general. And in that sense, they thought that the times of the millennium had come and it was the time in which which they could buy the Spaniards and actually won and recover the lands the Spaniards had taken up. Okay? But it was quite important. And by that time, appear a new term. For instance, and I have uh, written Masewales in a different book, you may have not noticed. Okay, but anyway, Masewales here has been written with C instead of S, okay? Because this is the, let's say, the actual way in which it's uh, performed. Well, written. But the thing is that uh, the Mutimasiwalis is also fight against some other, what used to be Pacific Indians who were actually working for the economic developments, for instance, haciendas and encomiendas that were taking place in the Yucatan at that time. Even though, in this case, were haciendas because the independence of Mexico had already taken place, but they have been living there since the encomienda period in during the colonial period of Yucatan. So here, start appearing a new term that is quite important for you right now. We start referring the Indian as mestizos. So, so the mestizos, and if you go to Mary Ellen today and you talk about, well, who is an Indian? They would tell you, well, there are no Indian here. They are called, they are mestizos, okay? And mestizos, it doesn't imply the same thing that in other you know, that in some other parts of Mexico, or even in uh, Peru, as, as Ula was mentioning. So in this case, mestizos refer to what would be called the Indian population of Yucatan. And also, is, um, it's also quite important because um, this was a kind of, we can say, some supposedly, and there is a lot of discussion about what they started using the term, but supposedly it's about some kind of recognition that uh, the Spaniards were given to the Indian population who actually was fighting with them against the Mayan rebels. Okay. However, what is important, I'm not going to go through the specific details, I just wanted to uh, mention what are the main problems. And what is important is that there are some different ways to name the Maya. First, archaeology hasn't had any problems about naming the Maya. They will go directly and say, okay, this is Mayan archaeology. There is no problem, so they are Mayans, okay? And if they, to be more precise, go to Mayans or Lola Mayans or Mayans, from the Lomba community, so there is no discussion about that. Okay. However, there are also, of course, some essentialist approaches in which they start related Maya to dress, language, ceremonies, and of course also applied to reason. And many of these things are coming basically from the state uh, government, from the federal government, and some other things. And also this a political approaches. For instance, if we're talking at if you remember the previous map in which we were talking about the whole Yucatan Peninsula when they divide the, the Yucatan Peninsula into three states, they also create the new categories. Mayan from Campeche, Mayans from Quintana Roo, and Mayans from Yucatan. And what is that? <coughs> it has to do with the political reason. Nothing. But they speak the same language, and there could be some dialects according to the place in which they are located, but they could be in one state. So, from my perspective, we want also to talk about Mayas, it would be just one group, or it's just one population. But anyway, the, the thing that in order to apply public policies, they have to divide that according to the states, okay? And also have to do some important implication because the public policies toward one specific state could be different from the rest of, of uh, could be different from other states. And uh, anthropology has, thank you. 
And anthropophic has also, uh, let's say, accepted the challenge of trying to deal with this whole idea of name deniers and how the idea of negotiating identities in terms of what is to be a Yucatec, for instance, and what is to be an Indian, and what are the relations between a Mayan, Yucatecan, and Indian who's been called an Indian. Actually, nobody's going to be called Indian, okay? Just, you will use that, and nobody will assume any kind of indigenous identity uh, in, 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 in Yucatan. They may say, I'm Mayan, but they don't strictly relate that to be an Indian or an indigenous. So this is another issue. So in this sense, we can see that some people will call about mestizos. Some other people, as archaeologists, will talk about Maya. Some other people will talk about Mayeros. And who would be a Mayero? The ones who actually can speak Maya, a pure Maya. So a Maya that cannot be contaminated by Spanish. Yeah. But the funny thing is that when you go to a place and you ask someone, oh, can you speak Maya? Uh, well, I know a little bit of Maya, but you know, I know this other people who actually he really speak Maya. So you go over there and ask him, oh, do you speak Maya? Well, no, I don't speak the pure Maya. You know, you have to go to this other small little <laughs> village and you may find someone over there. <laughs> well, this kind of approach also goes to the idea of who would be a Maya. The Maya well, is basically restricted for the ones who are now in the state of Quintana Roo and die. They're all around the places in which Villa Rojas did the work, the field work with Robert Redfield during the 1930s in, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And Witness is another name that is very specific and implies the whole idea of name themselves as men. And the Crusoe, the Crusoe is also a kind of interesting category that was actually used and introduced by anthropologists in order to refer to the followers of the cross, the stocking cross that was sending messages to the Mayan population during the caste war. So those are kind of categories that um, are actually in place, and the people can recognize or at least name some other people like that. Okay? And most of the mestizos are the ones that are in the northwest part of the Yucatan, of the state of Yucatan, basically surrounding Merida, of course, and going a little bit uh, further to the east. Well, I just left this one because I like it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice composition of a group of Maya women working in a cooperative. So, and those are part of the design that you can find in the traditional dresses. So. It's, it's a nice one. Just okay. One of the important things is that in terms, and I'm going to go real fast with that, in terms of the national and state politics, is that around 1940s in, in, in Mexico was created the National Indigenous Institute to deal with Maya, but, I'm sorry, with the indigenous population all over Mexico. You know that in Mexico there are about 60, well, this is a discussion in linguistics, I'm not going to go into that, but there are at least around 56, well, let's say more than 50 indigenous languages that can be spoken in Mexico, okay? So Mexico had to deal with also the diversity, the language diversity of so they create the National Institute, uh, National Indigenous Institute, or Instituto Nacional Indigenista. Now they change about, what, maybe 10 years ago, a little bit more. That is the Comisión Nacional para el Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas, best known as CDI. So, I would say CDI would refer to that. And of course, there are also some other uh, state agencies like in the Maya, that, that is the Institute for the Development of Maya people. All of them had to do and now relate the basic people to the idea of develop the Mayan population, um, the indigenous population, and then the Mayan population. Part of the approach, of course, is has to do with transferring technology in order to build a culture of art. So there was an initiative in 1979 first, in which they create indigenous radio station. So the idea is uh, they start developing um, radio station in which they could transmit in the language of population. And in this case, there are at least, uh, there's one in Yucatan who also, um, who is, uh, well, that is very important among the Mayan population and is close related to the things that are taking place in the community as well. And in 1990, this part of the organization was also, this part of the transparent technology was also important and they create 
the um, four uh, video indigenous centers, four indigenous in order to train them and also to produce videos. And one of them was in Sonora, another in Oaxaca, the third one in Michoacán, and the last one was also in Yucatan. On the other hand, um, they start producing a lot of stuff, and I'm going to refer that a little bit later. However, because of the things that are actually taking place, uh, well, I'm going to skip this one. But this is just an example of the things that they are doing within the producing of different, uh, let's say, demographic approaches to what uh, the INI and the CDI, what the CDI is doing now. Okay. So the CDI and the Mani in Yucatan are also taking part of a very important uh, quality that goes into promotion and cultural preservation. The, there are also generation, generator of visual archives, communication to alternative media organizations. There's also an important art there, organization of different companies, for instance. They are now playing, um, for instance, reggae with um, Maya reggae. I mean, that means that <laughs> lyrics are in Maya, but in all the as reggae music in that sense. And they are also doing kinds of competition or contests trying to decide who be, I always say, like, is, who will be the best man or something? It goes in the right direction. So they're also, and it's also interesting, but because um, they also have some applied projects in, this, in which the videos are actually trying to deal with some important issues. For instance, what would be the use of herbicides within the land for humidification, for the pollution within the community, and things like that. And, However, when we are talking about the idea of indigena or indigenous people, there is this conversation that Christian Leon and Gabriela Saberano were talking about. What would be some of the most important key issues? And I just struck part of the interview or conversation. And first is what is a what is video indigena? There is a huge discussion about that. Is the videos that are talking about the, 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 the indigenous are the videos that are actually made by the indigenous? are the ones that are in cooperation for them. And this is not the time, just as part that has to do in some ways, as part of the discussion goes, in terms of appropriation of the communities. It's also, um, has also to do with indigenous organizations sometimes, and also has to do with how the, um, how is represented the community and who has the, the power of the representation in those terms. I also support that. Another important thing is the tension that goes into individual production, production in terms of who is actually the creator of those videos. Um, who uh, is the individual? Is the one who are actually directing the videos? Is the, he the creator or artist? And on the other side, is, is the community that is actually uh, the one who is establishing or set the themes? So there is, um, I, I would say, kind of tension between what would be an artistic production or what would be a video for political activism. That is another area that is an area of tension, I would say. Also, there is the problem of dissemination of circulation. Who is the audience, actually? To whom they direct their, their, their videos. Also, there is another problem of consumption. What, would, what is the format? What would be the festivals in which those uh, uh, videos are going to be presented? What is uh, the access, actually, uh, to these videos by the by the community which has been involved or not. Because sometimes, and I have to say that, many of these videos that are produced go to international festivals are, are never screened in the, in the communities. This is an important thing. <coughs> in general, it's also important. Most of them are uh, related to documentary realism, but there are some fiction, docu-fiction, as some other people call it, and some of them are very experimental. Well, uh, communication is also important, and they're going to be uh, using Maya to communicate their ideas. Are they going to be subtitles? What is the strategy they have to deal with that? And they have to deal with some specific strategy. And of course, this is the participation of the media scape and the multicultural media <coughs> that are also important. Of course, they are always present in these arenas, and it's quite important they're present, because if you want to be part of an international festival, so you have to be on no, you have to be able to so this, there, there is no way to do it. And another important thing that um, Ginsburg has also mentioned is that the indigenous media has to be seen as a cultural process in terms of how it's uh, constructed. Well, 
where the idea is coming from, as also as its problems. So those are important here to consider. Taking into account that, sorry, um, I'm just going to briefly describe what are one of the main uh, aspects of every leader, the ones that are coming from the uh, CDI. And uh, well, those are the, the, the leaders that have been the general description of that. So it's one of the core centers that's always mentioning. There were 20 TPD videos produced from 2002 to 2011. Um, I'm going to skip that. This is important in those terms. What, is, uh, what we have to consider is some of them are spoken in Maya, in, in Maya with uh, Spanish subtitles and others in Spanish. However, one of the things that we have to consider at least about the characteristics of the videos they are producing. First, uh, is that um, they could be projects that are uh, directed by individuals or collectivities, both men and women, so there is important participation of women. They have a limited dissemination. There is a controlled edition. That means that they work together a very strong, very, uh, with the CDI people. So they know exactly what are, they don't have the control over the technology. <coughs> so they have to rely on just one person to decide what is in and what is out in most cases. Okay? There is a control, as I was saying, this is a controlled edition. There is a participation in national festivals. And another important thing is the project has to be submitted and approved by the CDI. So if you want some resources from the CDI, so you have to go through a process. And there will be some people, actually, some video makers who are invited to participate in that. But also, they are not controlling what would be the outcome in that sense. And another important thing is that they rely on um, their audiovisual ed um, equipment and editing so that means that they have to rely on the CDIs because they don't have the, the, the equipment to go on to, uh, to do the, the video. There is some example here. <coughs> this lady who was actually taking part of the, uh, they are talking basically this is for 2000. They are going to participate, as you can see here, the video indigenous of New York, okay? And they were part of these uh, activities, but who did this election? The CDI did this election. And one important issue, and I want to mention this, and I, can read, I, I like to, to read it as well, because uh, in this case, um, basically, uh, they are talking about what would be the consequences of the participation of, in this case, the Argentina with, with kids. Okay? And in this case, uh, she's talking about how she got into that uh, festival, and what is she going to do. There is another part of the Leonardo Mesh. And there are some pictures of them. Of them. They work together, actually. They're both in the same. And part of that is the CDI videos. Those are three CDI videos that was a result of that. And as you can see, this Sergio Novello will be participating in almost of the editing. On the other side, we have this alternative colleagues in Yucatan, and there is the organization. And of course, it takes a name of Yoshchelka Cine Video Cultural. Okay, so this is part of the organization, and they use this video of Tunish, this dragon pipe in Tunish. It means um, in Spanish libélula. Okay, so they use that. So they start in 2000. This part of this. Uh, general trying to move and some people who are actually participating in that are the ones, some of them have been working for the CDIs and they decide to move and to, and to take a different direction. However, it's quite interesting. This project is actually, I would say, guided by two anthropologists. And you may see some of the criteria and ideas and I'm going to start that. First, when they're talking about the project and they're defining an open and continuous um, <coughs> product, so it's never ended, it, has never, it will never finish. There is also, to reach, there's also a reason, in the same of the loose and Guattari. So it can go in one direction, in another direction, so it's defined enough. And sometimes you talk to the, to the people who participate in this, they will tell you like that, okay? They will tell you, okay, yeah, do something, something like that. 
And this, well, this also a new time. It has different places of entry, some other places to go out, so it's defined in those, in those terms. <coughs> and another important thing is a kind of to create something. I'm gonna skip. This is part of the another context that in which they train indigenous people. However, there's a very strong important, and this is different from the things that happen in the CI, in the authorship. So the idea that an individualistic creator, that is the one who is actually performing in, and, and, and the links between the individual and the community are hard to establish. Okay? I'm, I'm gonna, there is another, this is, there is another one that is here in English. This is the one in which he defined himself and uh, you can see he said Maya in this case. So it's very it's quite important in this definition in which yeah, this of course is part of the transnational media idea about what is it about what is it video uh, indigenous. So you cannot start and say, Well I speak Maya. You should to name something that can be recognized from outside as well. Okay, so those are this is those are part of an interviews. One and the very first one, I'm going to, they are translated, okay? And one of the latest told me, well, told me that I'm still in my Eso de ser Maya, pues la verdad, lo comencé a escuchar cuando empecé a trabajar en la CDI, allá en Mashkan. So he hasn't realized, she hasn't realized that she was in Maya until she saw the world. I have a translation here. Era en los albergues. Cuando estaba chiquita, que empecé a ver eso de que nosotros éramos mayas. Pero la verdad me preguntaba si eso era cierto. Me lo mostraban en los libros y me daban talleres de la cultura maya, pero no sé. Me daba trabajo convencerme tanto a mí como a mis compañeros. Okay. I have a translation. So. And this is the things in which part of this involvement, so they are learning how to be maya. So they are becoming maya through the participation of this. Uh, projects actually by the city. And if you go into that direction, I would say the political, the cultural policy has to do with preserving the culture. The very things have, you have to do is to these people to make them aware of what supposedly they are. However, if you talk with the colectivos independientes, you will. No nos metamos en categoría de esos de los mayas. Y esto no lo es. Eso solo es para ustedes los antropólogos. <laughs> <laughs> and the other well, well the translation there right now. So, okay. And then you said I'm not Okay. Okay, yo no puedo decir que soy Maya porque hago esto que okay. Por ejemplo, a mi madre <coughs> Maya Blante no le interesa todo eso. Ella con mucha gente Maya Blante difícilmente te va a responder que es Maya. Okay? So for them it's a kind to assume this whole idea of Maya and to be part of this media scape as and to be portrayed as Maya. So to well, not this one, but this other is a one. Okay. Well, first is they have an essentialist approach to the Mayan identity. They have they are basically the preserver the, uh, of this Mayan identity. There is of course a strong relation with public policies. There are of course a more uh, more important control con control over artistic and aesthetic expressions. There's also, and this is also quite important, and there is this hypothesis that can also be considered because they are promoters. Maybe the production can also be considered as handcraft. Handcraft not for the local consumption, maybe for for, um, <coughs> for the local consumption. Okay. And another thing is that it's a control dissemination and audience. Audience. On the contrary, this supposedly an open direction. There is a capitalization of Mayan identity that is the one who is actually going to have a very strong presence and power within the, the, the media and international levels. There is also, uh, the, they assume that, if, that you can be a Mayan in different directions with different uh, conditions, this is quite important. It's, it's also a meaning, uh, meaning of expressing individual art. This, and the idea um, that you don't have that there is a compromise toward the Mayan population, although this is not a quite open uh, uh, discussion, what be the contribution about that. Another important thing is that they also have this artistic view in which they are pushing for a wide dissemination of the product and for important participation in this in, um, 
video festival, the indigenous video festival. And um, well, another important thing is that they don't, they, they don't just see the idea of producing <coughs> videos, but they articulate different forms of, of artistic expressions. Okay? They are, for instance, they are very much into documentation and I'm sorry, fiction like, as, as a way to portray this Mayan uh, identity. So what I wanted to stress mainly is those, those two different tendencies, but that doesn't mean that in a way they want, they want to set apart or not essentialize. So there are levels that are not totally contradictory in a way, and there are some, of course, let's say, soft border or soft limits in which you can also see creativity, of course, in the case of the CDI videos, and also you can have this essentialist approach in terms of um, what would be the collective independent collectivos independientes, the collective that are actually producing videos in the region. Well, there are some references over here. So, yes. And I think that's it. Thank you very much.